questions. So it's we went a little. We're going to go over a little bit of what we said. We were. We're going to go. Um, there'll be lunch available. You can go in there, bring it inside. And we're probably going to about twelve thirty. So I know we told you twelve o'clock, but because of all the interaction, we're probably going to go over about a half an hour. So if you need to leave, we understand. We're all busy people, but um, but uh, just hang in there. And like I said, as soon as he finishes lunch, be Feel free to go out, lunch, get set up, and we're going to rock and roll. Great. Thank you. So I, I think for this round, um, the questions are just fun. You're making it fun for me, too. Um, I think what I'd like to do is, it, since it sounds like the food is coming in like half an hour or so, maybe it's we'll, here. It's, oh, it's here? Um, oh. It's one of the classes. Oh, I'll do that later. Thank okay. you. Um, all right. Well, let me, let me get through part of this and then I'll stop for questions and then I'll get through part of it and stop again. How, how about that? All right. So I've got, I stole your documents. Oh, I know, so I'm evil. Um, okay, it's not cheap. Uh, so I'm going to be playing off two documents. I've got term, uh, term sheet basics for angels. And then I've got this one with just this one weird paragraph, which is actually the NBCA uh, sample term sheet. It'll say that it's got a 2013 copyright date on it, but I printed this off uh, Thursday, so it's their most recent version of their term sheet. Uh, so I'm going to toggle back and forth between those two, but I kept it on there because I wanted to make sure that they got credit because it's pretty good and it's got some wonderful footnotes to it. Um, the good news about this particular segment is we're going to talk about some of the concepts that I've already mentioned in the, the morning. So this will go quicker. Uh, so first thing to understand is what's a term sheet? So you'll hear term sheets, letter of, un of intent, memorandum of understanding, MOI, MOD, WCF. Uh, what, are we, <laughs> what are we talking about? It's, it's, largely, it's largely all the same creature. Uh, for your purposes, you're pretty much always going to be talking about a term sheet. When I toggle to doing my acquisitions, sometimes I'll bust it up and there will be a letter of intent that will have some terms in there that I really do want to be binding on the parties. And then attached to it will be a term sheet that lays out all of the non-binding stuff. So binding versus non-binding, what does that mean? Uh, so when you're negotiating a term sheet with the startup, the idea is that you're doing broad strokes on what the deal is going to look like, but you haven't diligence the company yet. So you think you know what they are, but you won't know what the real story is until you get your arms into the gut. <coughs> so the idea would be that economic terms, you're going to have, forgive me ladies, a gentleman's reason. Uh, that's an understanding that we think that we're talking about we put in two million on a four million three, I'm going to get a third of the company. And here's the, the rates that I think I like. And we we think that those are going to be the terms, so we think we know who the investors are, but some might fall in and some might fall out. We're going to all figure this out together. But those terms should really be non-binding. Uh, it, it turns out that three months from now, we still aren't done, and you now have $40 million worth of revenue. You might want to talk about how this is all spent. Yeah. If it turns out he does diligence and he finds out, geez, this is like sexual harassment reality TV issue. He's going to want to change the valuation if he does the deal at all. So we're, we're, those would be non-binding terms. The things that ought to be binding are confidentiality and possibly exclusivity. So what do those two terms? Your eyes look wide. Um, so, uh, so confidentiality, when as an investor, you take the time to give somebody a term sheet, you're hoping that the startups are not going to shop for church. So so he offered me two million on a fourth. You do a little better, but it's got the guy's name on it. 
<laughs> you could at least it, it, say it rhymes with writer workers. Um, <laughs> try to be a little bit more creative. That's hard to try. So you really the the terms of the term sheet should be confidential. You want that to be confidential. Once the term sheet is signed by the funders, you would like them to agree that you're now in exclusive negotiations because you don't want to spend money on lawyers, accountants, other advisors, your companies, your time of your team reading through documents and inter interviewing people only to find out that, whoops, they shot the deal anyway. And they didn't show the terms, but they found better terms. And now there's a new set of controls that are coming in. So it is a way to keep everybody honest and ethical. That's why we have contracts. So we, we want a contractual agreement. We really are, for the next 90 days, you're not going to look for other investors other than the client. So the term sheet itself, you'll see in the, the MBCA term sheet, when you turn the page, at the top will be lovely language that only a lawyer would love that says in about 80 words or less. This is not binding, no joke, scouts on her. Here's a picture of me saying I agree it's not binding. The thing is not binding except for clauses 10 and 12 or whatever it is where the exclusivity and confidentiality come in. Now, why, why does it matter? Why would you, as an investor, you'd want to know that those terms are locked down? I want them binding on the company. Well, here's the thing. This is just supposed to be the skeleton. So this isn't the purchase agreement. It's not the investor rights agreement. You want to flush all that out later with the muscle and the flesh on the thing. So, I, you know, I, I talked with one of my mentors at Morrison and Forsberg local uh, when I was there, and he said that he had seen in venture deals three binding term sheets, and all three of them had ended in litigation. So why is that? Because you hadn't really come to an agreement. You came to a gentleman's agreement on some of the terms, but not all of the terms. So you don't want the thing to be binding, especially before you've done diligence. Because you don't even know what you're talking about. So we like non-binding. Mike? At the end of the day, there's a final term sheet and there is an agreement. I think most angels don't read the agreements. They just look at the term sheet. How do you know that the term sheet is really representative of the agreement? You ask your lawyer. <laughs> so if, you're, if, your lawyer is, if your lawyer is doing a good job, if your lawyer is doing a good job, your lawyer has a copy of the term sheet and a copy of the purchase agreement and they're going through checking off, making sure that not only is the language in there, but the language actually says what it's supposed to say, what the real meaning was of that shorthand version on how the dividends work. Okay. Now, you know, if you're putting in, if you're putting in 25K on a $2 million round, you just kind of do one of these. So it's not worth the, the five, six grand for the lawyer to look through that to figure it out. So I, I get it. But you know, it, it, you could you could effectively do part of the same exercise by taking the term sheet, taking your pencil, and saying, "Okay, buck twenty-five a share." There, I see redemption, right? Okay, we got one of those. Whether it reads right or not, <laughs> or knows, but you could at least try and sand it. Um, so we've talked about uh, term sheet versus LOI. We've talked about binding. Uh, who offers the term sheet? So uh, first time entrepreneurs will get badly confused and sometimes we all want our babies to be pretty. And when nobody uh, offers any money to the founder, they start worrying that their baby is not pretty and they make it so anxious that God bless Doc Stock and Y Combinator, they pull down the term sheet, fill it out and hand it to them. Um, in the advice that I give to a first time entrepreneur class that I teach at LAVA, I tell them, please, for the love of God, don't do that um, for a couple of reasons. And understand this is from the startup's perspective. One, you look like a bumpkin because nobody does that. Investors aren't going to say, gee, that's a great term sheet. I don't care what your company does. I'm going to look fast. That's not how that works. Plus, you're, you're playing poker against yourself. So the investor might have been willing to put in $1 million on a $4 million post. And you've offered one million on a three million post. So you know the the startups, if they're being counseled correctly, 
don't want to negotiate against themselves. It really ought to be for the investor to put the term sheet together. They're the ones making the offer to purchase shares. From the investor standpoint, uh, you want to make sure that the term sheet is not gummed up, drafted by an unsophisticated first time entrepreneur, and it ends up being unintentionally offensive. And so you put in the dividend rights you want, you put in the liquidation rights you want, and you circulate it amongst your little syndicate, and then you make the pitch. So the term sheet should almost always come from the investor. Uh, so when do you bring in the lawyer? Uh, well, it depends on whether you want it to be expensive or you want it to be cost effective. If you want it to be expensive, by all means, send the term sheet out before you consult the lawyer, because then the lawyer will have to undo some of the things you unintentionally did in the term sheet. So I had the most value when I helped craft the term sheet and can explain, you know, tell me about the deal, tell me what you're looking for. You know, Gary's worried about a lifestyle guy. Okay. You know, it'll be a little heavy handed, but let's put the redemption right in there and make sure we don't get sent. So those kinds of things, the lawyer can add value if you get them into the process ahead of the, the term sheet. Yeah. That's because you have the contract that you're essentially sending out, don't you want an expiration date on that too? The, the term sheet, if you're smart, you're putting in an expiration date. It definitely for acquisitions, we always do that. That This offer is only good for another week. Because I want to light a fuse under your butt to sign it and send it back, or at least get the dialogue started. You don't want them coming back ten years later and saying, yeah. well, "You know what? I'd like to do this deal." Now. Yeah, because an offer is good until it's officially not. Yeah, and if it's never officially dead, then you are you're going to have to affirmatively send a letter to the startup saying, "I never heard from you. Our offer is off the table." So that's a very good point. Okay, uh, so let's turn the page. Uh, so non-binding language, uh, lawyers have been very agitated about a case that came out of Delaware called Sega Technology. And amusingly, I negotiated, not on that deal, but against the guy who did this uh, little slippery trick um, from uh, this guy, James Breyer. He's an interesting guy, but he, he came up with this, uh, this term and managed to get it to work. So when you see a clause in a term sheet, it's supposed to be non-binding. And it says in there that the parties shall negotiate in good faith. You think, okay, that just sounds like some lawyer crap because the whole thing's non-binding anyway. So what difference does it make if we say we're negotiating in good faith? I guess that's just a nice way of saying, could we please treat each other civilly? And it meant more than that. So uh, I won't go through the, the case in great detail, but let's just say that uh, two parties came to a meeting of the minds and one party suddenly they got a, a massive uh, positive outcome on a, a customer that they were looking for and said, you know what, we don't, we like that number that you offered us with an extra two zeros. Like, what? And so the, uh, <laughs> The party said, that's not quite negotiating in good faith. And the Delaware court liked that argument. That negotiating in good faith doesn't mean you get to start adding extra zeros because your fact pattern changed. It means you agreed on those economics, my friend. And so you're, you should be doing those economics. What, you know, how the indemnification clause works, those things, that's to be negotiated. But you can't just go screwing around the whole deal. Uh, so be very careful if you're negotiating with a startup that's a Delaware corporation. You don't want to use your 1997 term sheet that has the parties will negotiate in good faith because it, it could bite them, it could bite you. Better to just get that the hell out of there and not get stuck. Um, so who negotiates the term sheet? Uh, it depends on how the investors want to play it, but from the company's perspective, the company would really like it if the investors would speak with one or maybe two voices. So they're looking for a lead investor that will negotiate the term sheet. So in the example I gave this morning, where $2 million round, I'm putting in 1.5, Patrick and Bill are throwing in a little bit of extra cash. They're gonna look to me to be the one that engages the lawyer and does all the day-to-day -day negotiations. They're gonna wanna see final deal docs because they're pretty savvy. 
and they're going to want to look against the term sheet to make sure the deal you know, Matt didn't wander off the reservation <laughs> go native and start agreeing <laughs> to stuff he shouldn't have. Um, but they're going to look to the lead investor, and so is the company. Uh, so you may, you know, you'll probably syndicate the round amongst yourselves, but someone ought to be our, our lead guy. Uh, and as a reminder, from the company's perspective, if they're smart and sophisticated, they are going to negotiate this term sheet with you because they know that everything they give you is going to come back to them compounded when they negotiate with the B and the C. So you may say, what does it matter to you if I get three demand registration rates? Well, it matters to me a lot because I'm going to have to get that to the B, the C, and the D, and I don't want it. So, you know, I, I may have to give that up for later rounds, but that would be for a hell of a lot more money. So that's the company's perspective when they look at your term sheet. So let's turn to the page. Uh, so one of the things that you'll see in the term sheet, sorry, I'm trying to be very respectful of your, your afternoon, so I'm not pointing to specific clauses in the term sheet, but one of the, the uh, actually two of the key points that you want to think about as you're preparing a term sheet is what's going to happen with the founders and what's going to happen with the employees. So from the founders perspective, you know, again, I keep saying this is going to outlast most marriages when you invest in a company. So you need to know that the founders aren't going to bolt on you. They need to be highly motivated. So the first time entrepreneur will sell 1 million shares to himself for $100 and he owns them outright. That's lovely for the founder. That's not so great for you. Because if you put in a new million dollars worth of cash, what's to prevent the founder from quitting on Tuesday and saying, I still own 60% of the company. That's not the deal. So typically sophisticated investors will say, we would like you to invest into your shares. Now for the unsophisticated founder, this will be like an ice uh, shower because they weren't expecting that conversation. But the sophisticated ones will understand, you know, you can ask me for vesting. I don't care. I'm not going anywhere. Just promise me you're not going to fire me, which I've caused, and I'm going to get hosed and lose my percentage. So there'll be a negotiation to be had. But you wouldn't grant an option to a, a founder what you would do is you would have them agree that their stock is now restricted stock. And they would enter into a restricted stock purchase agreement that says, you agreed in a subscription agreement in 2016 that you bought a million shares. We're going to amend that and agree that you still have a million shares and you don't have to pay any more money. But the company has a right to repurchase those shares if you don't stick around for the following time periods. So with a stock option, which, sorry, I, I said I was going to talk about that, and I did a lot to talk about, right? Uh, a stock option is not stock. It's an option to buy stock. And typically, you would grant that to an employee. A founder ought to own the stock outright. With the stock option, the employee's right to purchase and keep the shares will vest over time. In the classic Silicon Valley model is you grant me an option as your engineer number five for 10,000 shares of common stock, or five cents a share. And you expect me to stick around for four years. After four years, I should have earned my equity. So, the first year, I'm going to figure out how to fix the copy machine and where the men's room is. And I'm not really going to add value as an engineer number five until I figure out what it is I was supposed to be doing the last year. So you'll have cliff vesting. The first slug of my stock, my options, will not vest until I hit the one-year cliff. Four-year vesting, one-year cliff, 25% will vest at one year. And then the other 75% at that point it's not fair to, you know, make me take the risk of, geez, at one year and 11 months you fired me and now I don't get the next 25% slug. You best monthly after the cliff until you get to 100%. Why am I telling you about that right now? Because that kind of vesting is not appropriate for the founders. So if I'm the founder of Crowley.com 
and I've been working on my startup for six months. I own the stock outright, or at least I thought I did until I met you folks. Now you're going to ask me to vest in. I would like a couple things. One, I would like credit for time served. So I've already been working on it for six months. I'm going to argue with you. It's not fair for me to not vest until a year. What is that about? or to have none of it invested on day one of your investment. I would like credit for the six months I've been working. So I want some of my shares vested. Six months out of 48, I would like to own. I think that's fair. We'll negotiate. So then the question is, should I have cliff vesting? So I it would have vested 12 months after I started if I was employing that. Nah, normally you don't do that for founders. You, you give them credit for time served, and then you do monthly vesting all the way through the remaining period of the 48 months. So that, that would be market, and that would be how you would negotiate it. Now, the sophisticated uh, founders sitting in the back, they knew better than to do this. So in order to gain the negotiation a little bit, when they started this company a year ago, they put in restricted stock purchase agreements on their own without an investor putting it on them with the idea that they can say, you don't need to amend our agreement, we already have a restricted stock purchase agreement and here it is. So it might have some accelerators and some other stuff in there that you might not have allowed them to have, but because they've already negotiated it and you wanna leave them motivated, they're smart enough to have already grabbed that stuff in advance and now you're not gonna ask to yank it back. There, there was a question. I was gonna say a lot of times, they were as a founder, you already have your 10,000 shares of common stock. So how do, how do you invest that that's already been given? So with an option, it's kind of forward looking. Right. My right to keep my stock, to buy my stock and keep it vests. We changed the language, but it has the same meaning. With a founder, she owns the 10,000 and the company now has a new right to repurchase those shares. Oh. But the repurchase rate lapses as time goes by. How do you fix the price of that repurchase? Uh, so uh, the repurchase would be whatever they paid for. So if I paid a hundred dollars and I stay for uh, twelve months, you're gonna I get to keep twenty five percent. You're gonna write me a check for seventy five bucks and buy back my shares. Wow. So you have the founders undivided attention. Yes, yeah. Um, so, uh, and then there, there are other things that we're going to talk about on the restricted stock front a, a little bit later. So, from the investor standpoint, we want to make sure that the founders are locked into the cockpit, that they really are going to stay until the plane lands. Uh, so, we're going to use the restricted stock to maintain that. Uh, options. Yeah, on, on the options and also on the restricted stock. Um, all the organizations which I was involved with, they always had accelerated deposits as well. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Oh, okay. um, so the stock option plan I mentioned in the morning session that if you're putting in a significant amount of money, you would like the option plan to get put in before, immediately before you make your investment so that the, the option plan dilutes the founders and not you. If your intention is to buy 25% of the company, you want to buy 25% on a fully diluted basis. You don't want to buy 25% of the company, and then next week we put in an option plan that has a full equal to 20%, and now your 25% just turned to 20. Oops. So we, we don't like that movie. So the term sheet ought to talk about you before the closing, you're going to put in an option plan and what the size is. And so that'll be a negotiation with the founders on how big the pool should be. So let's turn the page. So the, the start of the NBCA term sheet is gonna go right into the economics. And it's gonna talk about the pre-money valuation of the company and the amount of the investment. So this is a simple concept we talked about at this point. The, if I am going to put in a million dollars and get 25% of the company, I just said the company's worth three million before I got there. 75%. My million is worth 25%. 3 million plus 1 million means post money after my money went in. The value of the company would be 4 million. 
then the term sheet should talk about when we talk about the million dollar raise for the Series A, are we talking about a million from new investors or are we going to allow the founders to count some of the convertible notes? So that's a negotiation. We may also have multiple closings. So I had a client recently that wanted to do a $5 million closing. They had uh, 4.4 million lined up and they had another party who was a sports star who was talking about putting in another 600K but said that uh, his little shop needed an extra couple months to think about it. And he said, we need the money, we gotta go now. Uh, so we're gonna do a first closing on the 4.4, but we'll agree that if you can get your money in on the 600 before August 31st, we'll allow you to buy some extra Series A shares. So the investors at this, the first closing agreed that they were willing to be diluted by that extra 600,000, that the round was really gonna be a $5 million round. That was our hope. If the other investor didn't come in, our, my client was more than prepared to go the next 18 months without raising more money. So the investors ended up not getting diluted by the series. Uh, so you may see multiple closings inside the term sheet. Then there's the price per share. And how do you figure out what the price for a share of Series A should be? Well, it's the post money valuation divided by the fully diluted cap number. So if we've got a couple million worth of common, the Series A is gonna get a million shares. We've got an option plan for a couple hundred thousand shares. We've got a warrant for 10,000 shares. Then we're gonna divide the post money, the $4 million of total company value by the, what's the maximum number of shares that could exist, that's what our series A for should be. So, yeah. Um, to, to calculate post money valuation, pre money valuation, do you, if you have an unexercised warrant for a million dollars, do you count it as a valuation or not? Uh, no, that, that's, uh, that's money to the company, but it doesn't impact what Chevron's gonna be willing to pay to buy the company. So the, the, the post money valuation, we're saying the whole company is worth to an acquirer this much money. So it's not related to the balance sheet. It's not related to any of it. But when you, when you calculate in your, your valuation, say there's an unexercised warrant or exercise amount price is million dollar. And do you, do you include that? You include the shares. You include the shares, but you're not including that value. Okay, uh, so the next thing we're gonna see in the term sheet are those famous uh, liquidation preference and dividend sections. So uh, this will give you a, an idea, you can look at it later this weekend, but if you wanna see in a term sheet what a liquidation preference looks like, you'll see those examples in the term sheet and you'll also see the different flavors of how the uh, dividend structure could work. Uh, then you're going to see protective provisions. So what we were talking about this morning, you'll see some examples of what NBCA recommends that its members request when they're looking for protective provisions. So that ought to be helpful to you. Uh, the next slide, page eight, uh, conversion. Uh, gentleman asked me about conversion earlier. So much like everything uh, else with the conversion feature is also negotiable. Uh, you may have non-convertible preferred. If you do, basically you're saying the preferred is dead. The idea is that you're going to want an IPO or you're going to want a very large exit, at which point the preferred might convert. You'll see terms in this term sheet that talk about optional conversion and talk about mandatory so from an optional conversion standpoint, there are a couple of scenarios where as a Series A preferred stockholder, I would like my shares to convert. So one is we're gonna go public. We reach the promise line. So Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, uh, they're gonna look at the preferred holders and say, 
we're going public, we cannot have preferred stock. The market won't understand it. We can only have common stock. So we want all of you guys to convert when we go public. So and that's in everybody's interest. We no longer need liquidation preferences. We we got liquidation all day and all night. It's called going Ameritrade and sell your common stock after you register, or you get out to a roll on forty four. So you would agree that in order to go public, for if and when we actually do, not until the last possible second, then we're going to agree to convert. Uh, so on an IPO, we may agree to a deemed conversion, like we were talking about with the participation cap. We, we may agree if we get the $55 million and $1, economically, it makes sense for us to convert. Uh, there may also be other reasons that are less happy. Uh, so uh, you may want a mandatory conversion if 75% of the Series A shares vote to convert. You might say, what does that mean? And what it could mean is the company has run itself into the ground and uh, the vulture capitalist shows up and says, I am willing to put in more money at half the valuation that you guys did on the last round. But I don't have to, want to have to fight with you guys over the carcass. So I want all the Series A preferred shareholders to agree that they're going to give up their liquidation preference, the dividends, everything, their board seat. I want to pay them over all of it. And you all made a dumb investment. So now you can be common stockholders and still be grateful to me that I put in money and saved this stupid company. So I'm going to force the Series A to convert. True. So you might see that scenario. Uh, okay, so let's go on to page nine. So uh, here's a, it, you'll see in the term sheet an example of how the weighted average anti-dilution formula works. And then on page 10, uh, uh, I promise to talk with you a little bit more about narrow base versus broad base. Can I just ask a question about that? Please. The percentage series A, is that to, to force like a small number of holdouts? Or it's, it's, it's also to, to make sure that uh, you don't have a, a partial conversion of the series A. So if it's in the interest of the, the lead of the syndicate to have the series A convert, you want to make sure that all the Series A converts. So even though you put in 20 bucks and I put in 10 million, I want you to have to convert. Very good. Uh, so weighted average anti-dilution again. Uh, so I told you that broad-based weighted average anti-dilution says uh, when we figure out the denominator in that horrible formula, we want to be able to count everything on a fully diluted basis. The, uh, the founders may negotiate for narrow-based weighted average anti-dilution so that there's less of an impact on them. Um, it's a negotiation, uh, unlike the ratchet where only 1% of deals in the country get a ratchet. The, the difference between narrow-based and broad-based, you know, it's a bit of a jump ball, it's a negotiation. Um, but that's something for you to negotiate with the founders. Then there's what's called a pay to play provision. And this impacts the uh, anti-dilution in your ability to use it. So here, if you want a uh, weighted average anti-dilution protection, it, there may be a clause that requires you to agree that you're gonna invest in this next uh, round. And if you do that, you'll be allowed to have weighted average anti-dilution protection in future rounds. But if you don't want to pay, you can't play, and your weighted average anti-dilution protection is going to disappear. So you got to help us out on this down round. If you're willing to help, we're willing to allow you to keep it. If not, then it goes away. So who's, who's making this demand? That would be the new investor. So the new investor says, I'm only putting in Series B money if A agrees to amend their terms to put in this pay to play. Um, so again, hard times bring 
hard remedies. Uh, so now let's talk about investor rights agreements uh, and registration rights. This takes up an inordinate amount of the term sheet, and I, I said it earlier that it was science fiction, and I, I kind of meant it. <laughs> so what are registration rights, and, and why are they science fiction? So when a company goes public, that doesn't mean that all of the shares are immediately tradable on the stock exchange. It, it doesn't. They, so the, the shares that you own as investors are still restricted stock, and you can't sell them unless you can find an exemption or someone is kind enough to register your shares. So what is getting registered? Why is there this gigantic file? Well, what the company is doing, so Crowley Corp decides to go public. What I'm doing is I'm authorizing new shares, and we're going to go sell those to new investors. And we're telling those new investors, when you buy those shares, those shares are totally liquid and can be traded anywhere, any day, any time. Only those shares. Now, Kleiner Perkins and SoftBank and others would like to get out along with you. So how does that work? Well, when you buy your preferred stock, you try to be a little forward thinking and say, in the event that we hit the promise land and we go public, I would like to know that at some point, you're going to register my shares for me. And so what you will negotiate is as a class, or at least for the major investors, that if X number of the shares of Series A make a demand that at least once the company at its own expense within a certain period of time will actually register some of your shares. Maybe all of them, but at least some of them. That would be a demand break. Now the company doesn't want to agree to unlimited demands. Why? Because it's expensive doing registration statements. They have to pay law firms $100,000, $200,000 to do one of those. And they're not easy and they're extremely distracting for management once they're running a public company. So they might grant you one demand, they really don't want to grant you two, but if they have no choice, they will. Then the other one that they'll talk about is they'll talk about a form S3 registration. Uh, oh no, here we come with one more. Simple, simple answer is an S3. The S1 is a horrible registration statement and it's very painful and very expensive to do. Once your company's been around for a year as a publicly listed company, and it meets certain dollar thresholds on things, then you can use a narrower registration statement. So the demand might come ahead of the company qualifying for an S3. For S3s, they're willing to do them more frequently for you, um, but again, they really rather not do it. Uh, so that's a negotiation. Another place where your shares could be registered is maybe you have negotiated piggyback rights. So the company goes public, they sell a bunch of shares into the market, and then a year later they haven't hit the S3 requirements, but they're going to do a follow-on offering, a secondary offering into the market. They may have agreed in the investor rights agreement that the investors are allowed to latch on and to the extent that they're going to do a hundred million dollar offering, maybe they'll only do a ninety million dollar offering and allow ten million dollars worth of your shares to latch onto that offering and get in, so that you can now sell your shares uh, without having to comply with a bunch of other requirements. Normally, the company will negotiate cutback rates. That gosh, if we're oversubscribed and there's no way for you, we're leaving you behind because. The reason we're doing the offering is to raise more money. So that's good for you, just be patient with us. So they may want to cut back and take back. Now, all of this is lovely, except, you know, it's sort of like the saying about war, you know, you have a great plan for war until the war actually starts and then the current surplus. The, the same thing's true with a public <coughs> offering. You can negotiate all these demand rights and that's lovely. When the company's gone public, it may not be in anybody's interest to have a bunch of people do a land rush to try and get out and sell their shares. So even though you have the demand right, it might not be in your interest, the company's interest, other shareholders to exercise that demand right. 
So you may end up renegotiating it every single round. And then when you go public, the iBankers are gonna lean into, please waive your rights on this, waive your right on that. So lawyers spend lots of time talking about philosophy and what's market. At the end of the day, I personally will spend some time, but not a lot of time negotiating red rights because I know how the movie's gonna end. Um, there's also been some changes to Rule 144. What, what is that creature? What it says is if you're not a control person, so you're not Kleiner Perkins, you're Matt Crowley. He only owns $25,000 worth of Crowley.com. You're not a control person, you're not on the board, you don't have a say for how the company's run. Shouldn't I be able, if I hold the stock for a period of time, to be able to get out? You know, there ought to be some shot clock at the end of the day. So if you hold the stock for a period of time, you may not need a registration statement. You can go to your broker and show the broker, the company went public here, I've been holding the pump, the stock for this long, I'll sign whatever you want me to sign, and I, I swear on my son's life, I'm not a control person. And then you can go ahead and sell your shares into the market. So rule 144 is there as a backstop to make sure that ultimately, if your company does go public, that you can sell your shares. So uh, again, this is another way of me saying, don't get overly stressed about reg rates, but you can see lawyers spend an awful lot of time thinking about it in the term sheet for your benefit, theoretically. Um, other stuff that you'll see in the term sheet related to the registration rights agreement, there will be a lockup provision and again, this is geared to preventing a land rush. So SNAP goes public. They've got a bunch of employees that would love to start selling their shares into the market. Your investors, you would love to sell your shares into the market. You know, maybe you can get the rule 144 to work faster for you. But regardless, they would like you not to be selling your shares into the market. So they would like you to agree in the investor rights agreement that if the investment bankers ask you to, that you will agree to let your shares stay locked up for a period of 180 days. So that, that period is fairly standard. It's negotiable like everything else, but it's almost always 180 days. With the idea that over time, the iBankers have learned that's how much time the public market takes to absorb the shares that have come out of the IPO and for trading to level off and find its footing. So at 180 days, the market can now absorb a second wave of shares showing up in the market. That's the theory. That is very standard, ought to be in every term sheet. Information rights. You'll see a section in the term sheet that will now lay out what the investor's expectations are. So again, $2 million round, million and a half out of me, quarter out of Patrick, quarter out of Bill, I may negotiate as the lead, as a major holder, anyone who invested north of $1,499,000 ought to have the right to these following <coughs> bits of information. I would like quarterly financials, they can be unaudited, I want them audited once a year, I want this, I want that. That would land in the uh, investor rights agreement and it's gotta be in the term sheet, it's an important thing. Um, then there's preemptive rights. So we didn't talk about that this morning, but that's another term that shows up in the term sheet. Uh, preemptive rights, uh, there are good arguments and bad arguments, uh, or upside downside to having preemptive rights. What are they? So if you're a Series A investor and you know this company's gonna need more capital, they're gonna have to do a new thing at some point. You might like the right to maintain your percentage in the company. So you're at 25%, you wanna stay at 25%. Now you could look at the dilution that's gonna come in the B round, I don't really care. I don't wanna put any more money into this play. That's okay, but if you would like to at least have the option to get in on the B round, you would ask for the right to preemptively purchase shares that are gonna be offered to other B investors. So it's, a way of saying set aside 25% for Matt because I might want to buy those. 
that they aren't going to be required to hold them there forever. What it is is they're going to give me a notice saying that we're going to do a B round. We've located the lead. Here's the term sheet. Do you want in on this thing? You got a shot clock, 20 days, 30 days, whatever it is. And if you don't answer by then or you say no, we're selling it to somebody else. <clears throat> so that would be how the preemptive rate would work. So the question would be, well, geez, why wouldn't I ask for that in the field? Well, sophisticated in, uh, founders, counsel for founders, are going to present you with the argument that, hey, you know, we get that. You want this right. But we don't want you to stand in our way if we can get Sequoia to invest. I don't want to tell Sequoia that they got to sit and wait for 30 days while you fart around and decide whether you're going to buy your 2% of the company. I don't want that. So if I'm going to agree to it at all, I only want to give preemptive rights to major investors north of a certain threshold, not everybody in the A round. And I'd really rather not give it to you at all. Besides, Bruce, you're on the board. So you're going to have a say over how you shape the green round anyway. And we're probably going to take care of it. So if you want in, great. But please don't put this into the charter and mess me up. So that's the conversation that you'll hear on preemptive rights. So we turn the page with me. Uh, more stuff about the founders. We're obsessed about the founders. Uh, another thing that we put in there, and the founders eyes will glaze over, but this is really important to us as investors. Uh, we want to make sure that it's blazingly clear to the founders that everybody before we invest must sign a confidentiality and proprietary invention assignment. What was that in English? We want anyone who touches this company not to steal, steal our trade secrets. And if we have an engineer creating code or they come up with some really cool invention, we want to make sure the company owns it. When I joined Revoke, we had a VP of sales who said, I never signed anything, so I'm not signing anything. I said, well, that's nice. We just won't get any money. Said, what? I said, shoot, get off it. Everybody's got to sign it now. The investor wants to know that what they're investing in isn't going to walk off with somebody. So they're going to insist on this. And so eventually I got her to sign, or I should say the CEO got her to sign. Um, but, but that's that's important for you. You want to make sure that the, the core thing that you're investing in doesn't walk out the door Tuesday at 1 a.m. Uh, you're also going to be interested uh, in getting a right of first refusal and co-sale agreement. Uh, we were just about going through this and poor people haven't grabbed sandwiches. We're very close to finish. Uh, so uh, another thing that I would like to know about the founders, I've got their shares vesting. So they're motivated to stay. The other thing that I want to do is I want to make sure that they don't exit on me early, not physically, but I don't want them to start selling off their shares without me having an ability to intercept them. And mainly I want it as a speed bump. I want to slow the founders down and make them think twice. Now I'll tell you as a matter of public policy, whether you're California, Delaware, Zimbabwe, it doesn't matter virtually every jurisdiction will say, you can't tell someone that they can never sell their shares. That just doesn't work. But what you can do is you can put in a bunch of speed bumps to make them think twice and to maybe intercept the deal. So for a founder, not only do I want their shares now subject to restricted stock, but I want them subject to a right of first refusal. There's two types of rights. There's a right of first offer and a right of first refusal. So I'm a founder. We've been doing well the last three years. I really need a Porsche. So I, the question is, a Porsche is going to cost me anything. So I could try to sell my shares to you for 80 grand. Problem is, is you're going to say, I think 100,000 shares is worth 80 grand. I'm going to say, you're insane. 10,000 shares is worth 80 grand. You should pay me more for less. So you and I, all we're going to do is piss each other off. So normally you don't have a right of first offer. I must offer it to you before I shop it. Instead, you ask for a right of first refusal, which is I find this fella and he's willing to pay me 80 grand, 60 grand tomorrow, and then 20 grand he'll pay me on Tuesday, Wednesday, on my push. 
So I'm going to take his terms and I'm going to offer those exact same terms to you. You have the right to intercept. I offered it to him first, but I have to take that offer to you and you can decide yes or no on whether you like that. Now you may want more stock, in which case you write the check. I honestly don't care. I just want a portion. So the founders should be ambivalent to this. Um, the next one is a co-sale right. And this is another way to slow the founder down a little bit. If <clears throat> they decide to sell and I don't have 80 grand laying around, what I might like to do is to say, if he wants to buy 80,000 worth of stock, I know where he could find some stock. How about if 20% of that is some of my shares? Because this thing is a dog. So <laughs> you can sell 60,000 of your shares, I'm selling 20. So you say, well, then I don't get a Porsche. <laughs> so that slows the deal. Down. So you might ask for the right of first refusal and the co-sale. Uh, and then you may also ask for drag-along rights. So what's that? So a drag-along right says uh, <clears throat> the, the founder is uh, a, little, a little crazy and they think that we've got a billion dollar company and well, we all hope that she's right. But quite frankly, if we get an offer for a hundred million dollars, we're out of here. So what you want is the ability to drag minority shareholders along. Normally, a Google is going to want to buy the assets of your company, not your stock. But in the event that they want to buy the stock, we want to make sure that Julie, our CFO, doesn't stop the deal because she doesn't want to sell. And Google says, God, I don't want an angry minority shareholder. This is just going to be lawsuits for the next five years. No, you got to get her out of there. If you have the right to drag her along, then you don't have that. So you might negotiate all that. Those are material terms. So typically they show up in the term sheet. Uh, one sort of semi-funny one that shows up in the term sheet is legal expenses. So the sophisticated investor doesn't really like paying for more than they have to. They're already investing $2 million in Crowley.com. They would like some of that money to go to pay Scanning's law bill. And so what they'll say is, you know, we think if you keep this simple, our bill's going to be $25,000, $35,000 for a lawyer to do the deal. We would like the company to pay the investor's legal expenses. So your $2 million is just a round trip. You're, you're going to end up, that money is going to get used to pay SCAD. But you still get $2 million with the stock. So it, it ends up giving you a, a slight benefit by getting your legal expenses as part of the term sheet. Now, founders should pay very close attention to that because uh, that, that money is coming out of the proceeds that you work so hard to get. So you don't want Scadden who's drafting the term sheet to say, actually, we like 50,000 for legal fees. We probably won't care. Yes, we don't. <laughs> uh, we, we don't want that. So your, your lawyer is, or she is paying attention to try and keep that cap as low as possible. Uh, so, you know, market kind of 20, 25, 30-ish. If you see a five in their first digit, no. Uh, so, in conclusion, now you guys are finally going to get to go outside. Uh, we've learned about binding versus non-binding term sheets. We learned a lot more about valuation. We now have wonderful examples of how the different provisions play out. Uh, do not use them without some adult supervision from lawyers. We've gone on a deeper dive on anti-dilution. We know about reg rights. We know how we want to manage our co-founders. So that's an awful lot of stuff. Um, so questions before we do corner bakery? Okay, I've, I've worn you out. Thank you for giving me a second.
have some fun with it, okay? Again, give it up for Matt for doing his half